right, good evening, everybody. Today is Monday, July 13th, 2024. The time is 6 p.m. At this time, I will go ahead and call the meeting to order. It is the 15th, July 15th. I apologize, correction. Ms. Trish, can we please have a roll call? Council Member Adam. Here. Council Member Maldonado. Here. Council Member Bucciolato. Here. Council Member Neal. Here. Council Member Larson will be out today. Vice Mayor Mendoza. Here. Mayor Walter. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you so much. At this time, we will rise for a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. At this time, we'll go ahead and open up our first call to the public. Is there anybody in the public that would like to speak at this time? All right, and I do not have any, so there will be a second call to the public. I'm going to close the first call to the public. Item six is our presentations, and first I'd like to start with item A. This is a presentation on the prophylactical, la la la. Okay, the P. The substances, the PFAs, and their new enforceable levels finalized by the Environmental Protection Agency and Water Quality Compliance Monitoring with the new rule. Paige, will you come up and educate us, please? Yes, I will. Thank you so much. Hey, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of the Council. Tonight I do have two presentations to go over. Um, the first one, it's a little bit easier to call it PFAPS. It's a little bit hard to pronounce for me as well. And then the second one's going to be about our annual consumer confidence report, or our annual water quality report. Um, so as far as PFAFs, um, I have only good things to report about it, um, and there's nothing really regulatory that we need to do at this time, but I figured I would report good news and keep the transparency so everyone kind of has an idea of where we are, because in the water industry, it's a bit of a hot topic at the moment. So, so key points for this presentation, so what are PFAFs? What are those new enforceable levels that the EPA has set for these compounds? And a couple of compliance and monitoring things that our staff's gonna be doing to make sure that we're complying with the EPA's new regulation. So what are PFAFs? Um, they are chemical compounds that are used in non-stick or water-resistant products. Um, so that can be like um, clothing, firefighting foams use it, um, non-stick cookware, paints, sealants, pesticides, anything that's meant to keep out water or grease and things like that could potentially contain PFAS. And the reason that they're dangerous is they, can, they don't easily break down within the environment. They tend to persist for a long time, and sometimes they're known as forever chemicals. Um, there's a few health risks that are associated with PFAFs as far as cholesterol, immune response, um, risk of cancer, reduced chance of pregnancy, hormonal um, interference, and developmental delays. So there's a few things that are associated with PFAFs, and that's why it's kind of been a hot topic recently, is because of those things that can happen. Um, the reason that PFAFs has been 
in the water industry and talked about a lot recently is the EPA released the fifth unregulated contaminant monitoring rule um, in 2021. And essentially what that is, is the Safe Drinking Water Act requires that the EPA um, create a list of compounds or chemicals, contaminants um, that they see could require monitoring by public water systems. And PFAFs was the most recent one that they looked at, and we're still doing monitoring for this as well. Um, but that's essentially where it came from. And once, as they're looking at these UCMR5 results, they're coming up with these new regulated levels. Um, I do have the regulated levels up on here. You'll see that there's six different PFAS compounds um, that they're now going to be regulating within water systems. Um, so we have PFOA, PFOS, PFHXS, HFPODA, PFNA, and PFBS. And then the last one down there, you're going to see something called a hazard index, which I'll go over in just a second. Um, but they're also measuring certain PFAFs um, within mixtures because they tend to um, show up together. So you'll see a term up there. It's called MCL, and that stands for maximum contaminant level. And essentially with that level, it, that's the maximum level of a contaminant that we can have within our drinking water. So the first two, those are considered to be carcinogens. So their PFAFs or their MCLs are a little bit lower um, at four parts per trillion. And then we see 10 parts per trillion. And then PFBFs is only measured within that hazard index. But I think what's really important to note here is the parts per trillion and how small that number is. Um, as you could imagine, it's one in a trillion. So I did put something up here that kind of shows how small these numbers really are and what we're going to be looking at. So one part per trillion is equivalent to one drop of water in 20 Olympic sized swimming pools. So it's, it's a very, very small amount. Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind, especially with all those health concerns that are associated with them, like how small that these numbers really are. So this is that hazard index that um, I showed on the last slide. Like I said, there's a few PFAFs um, that they're measuring within um, mixtures together. And in order to measure that, they've created this equation that will help them come up with a safe level for um, those compounds that are mixed within. I won't go too much into depth on this equation, but I just wanted to tell you guys, like, this is how they figured out that hazard index. Um, and through the equation, you would want it to be less than 1. Um, anything greater than 1 would be an exceedance of the MCL. So here is a really interesting slide with lots of numbers on it. But these are our sampling results that we've collected for our UCMR5 as we're doing our emissional monitoring for PFAFs. Um, and you can see here um, we have four different active wells that are supplying drinking water to citizens right now. And up there I have the, um, our reported levels for each of those wells. So at the top, you can see those MCLs that are up there in yellow. And as you go down, you'll start to see what our levels are. So we'll start off um, just going from left to right. I'll try and go quick with it. So with PFOA, um, four parts per trillion. They want a standard four PPT. Um, for wells one and two, you're going to see ND, which um, that stands for non-detectable. So Essentially, what that means is that whatever we have in our water, it's either non-existent or it is too small for them to even detect, so it leaves us under the MCL for those. So for PFOA, we're non-detectable for all four of our drinking wells. Also for PFOS, same thing. So they want us at four PPT. We are at non-detectable um, at all of our drinking wells. For PFHXS, um, it wants us at 10 parts per trillion. Um, wells 3 and 4, non-detectable. Wells 1 and 2, we did detect small amounts of them, but they are under the MCL. Um, PFNA and HFPO, we are non-detectable. 
and for PFBS, we did detect small amounts of that, but that one's only measured within mixture concentrations within the hazard index. So even though we did pick up a little bit higher numbers there, it still keeps us under the MCL and it's still considered safe for consumption by the EPA. Thank you. Okay, and then just to put this into perspective, I did include um, some results that other municipalities have posted because this is something that a lot of us are already looking into as far as treatment wise but you can see here how our numbers kind of compare to those other municipalities in our area um, some of them are detecting ones that we are not some of them are higher some of them are lower but this here is really just to give some sort of comparison for you guys on where we are and then the next thing, um, if we, in the future, I'm not saying right now, like we need to go out and spend all this money, treat, whatever, we are already under the MCL for all of them, but I did think it was important to note, um, if in the future our levels did end up going higher, there are treatment options available, however, they can be very expensive. Um, so there's anion exchange, high pressure membranes, and granular activated carbon. Um, all of them have the ability to remove PFAS from water, but at this time, um, it's not necessary. However, I just wanted to be transparent in case in the future it did ever become necessary. This is the route we would need to go down. So compliance and monitoring. Um, within three years, we have to finish our initial monitoring. So that's what we're working on right now. Um, starting in 2027, we have to start reporting our PFAS levels within our annual water quality report that goes out um, to residents. And we have to start issuing public notifications of violations. And at five years in 2029, um, we need to be within compliance with all MCLs. Um, so at this point, we're just going to continue monitoring and making sure that we're continuing to stay with under the MCLs. Questions? Council, do you have any questions on the perfluorolycle or polyfluorolycles? I have one question. Where do they come from? How would they get into our water? So they can, they're created by companies, so they're within all of those water resistant products. Um, so all of when companies are making that products, even like if you're washing dishes, it can go into the water or waste from whatever. Um, their factory it can go into the water so it's it's not naturally occurring but it is hard to break down and it's found within all of those products thank you mm -hmm. any other questions or comments thank you for the presentation and you also have additional information on our water quality data included in the 2023 consumer confidence report So our annual consumer confidence report, this is our water quality report that is a snapshot of our water quality within a year. It goes out to our residents every year. Um, so it's required by the EPA under the Safe Drinking Water Act. It's distributed annually. We have it on our website every year. This year it was sent out electronically with um, June bills, but like I said, it acts as a snapshot of water quality for a one-year period. So as we go through this presentation, all the water quality um, figures that you're seeing are all from 2023, not 2024, so it's a complete snapshot of 2023. So there's a few things that are included within the water quality report. So EPA requires that we disclose what our source water is, and that's essentially where the source out of water is coming from. 
So our source water, um, it's all exclusively from groundwater at this time, and that comes from a combination of our four active wells, which we talked about a little bit in the last one. Um, and we, for um, treatment-wise, just a small amount of chlorine and disinfection is implied at entry points to the distribution system to make sure um, that water is clean and safe and we're within compliance. So there's a few different types of contaminants um, that are included within the annual water quality report. So those are gonna be microbial contaminants, including like viruses and bacteria that can naturally enter the water, um, inorganic, inorganic chemicals, um, pesticides, herbicides, radioactive contaminants. So all of them can naturally enter into the water system um, just by natural occurrences. So, but it's our job to make sure that we're monitoring and making sure that we're keeping the water safe. Um, just like in the last one, there's a few health risks associated with a few of the contaminants that are listed within the CCR, um, and including vulnerable populations. Um, if there's anyone who feels that they need to speak with their medical provider, they can. However, um, we are under everything. So there's a few definitions, so action level, um, MCL, which we talked about in the last one, maximum contaminant level goal, and maximum residual disinfectant level goal. The only ones that we're really gonna be looking at is that maximum contaminant level, because if I went through all of them, it would take all night. So maximum contaminant level, that's the one that we're gonna focus on. Um, that's the one, that's the legal level that we have to stay under, required by the EPA. In our last presentation, um, the numbers that we were looking at were in parts per trillion. What we're gonna be looking at now is parts per million and parts per billion. So they're a little bit larger than parts per trillion, but they're still very, very small quantities. So one part per million, that's equivalent to one drop in 13.2 gallons of water. Um, parts per billion, equivalent to one drop in 13,208 gallons. So they're still fairly small quantities. Um, something that's on our um, CCR it is coliform bacteria. So what this is, it's a harmless organism. Um, it naturally occurs within the environment. I did include a diagram so you can kind of see how that kind of goes down. But essentially the way that, um, or let me backtrack. So coliform bacteria, what it is, um, it's an indicator organism, so if you have it within your water, it doesn't necessarily mean the water is unsafe. We check for it um, because it's an indicator for E. coli. So if we ever got a positive of this type of bacteria, it would prompt us to test for E. coli. So when you look at this, um, our results up here, they want us, um, they obviously don't want us to have E. coli in our water, so they don't want us to get positive hits of this type of bacteria. Um, but you'll see here it says we had one positive sample. So when we have that positive sample, we had to retest our water to check for E. coli uh, because that indicator organism was present. However, it came back negative for E. coli. And the next two things that you would see on our water quality report are our lead and copper levels. So I've presented on these before, um, but just a quick reminder, so lead and copper, um, the last time we tested for them was in 2021, um, when because our numbers are consistently under the MCL, our um, testing requirements have been lengthened to every three years, so we will be doing another test for lead and copper this year in 2024. But these are our most recent ones. Um, we had no violations to report on this one. This one's reported a little bit differently. Um, you'll see the 90th percentile that's right here. So they wanna, or you can see here at our results, for copper, 90% of our results were under 1.11 parts per million, and we have to be um, at 1.3 or below. So we're well below. And then for lead, we were non-detectable for lead. So as far as that, we're not in violation either. 
Um, some more regulated contaminants, so disinfectants and disinfectant byproducts. I said earlier that we use chlorine in order to disinfect the water to make it safer and get rid of all those bad things that we don't want in it. Um, and you can't just put as much chlorine in it as you feel like. There is a regulated amount that you have to um, stay under, um, so you're not putting the community members at risk. So for this one, our maximum contaminant level, um, they want us to stay under four parts per million. Our range of levels detected 0.79 to 1.13, so we're below um, the level that they would want us to be at, so we're in compliance. And total trihalomethanes, um, that's a disinfectant byproduct. So when disinfectants like chlorine interact with organic material in the water, it can create these. Um, but they want us to stay under 80 parts per billion, and we're well below 8.2. Okay, and I believe this is our last one for regulated contaminants. So arsenic, barium, fluoride, and nitrate. Um, you can see over here. Um, for arsenic, it would like us to be under 10 parts per billion. Our highest level detected is 2.2. For barium, it would like us to be under 2 parts per million. We are at 0.0058. Fluoride, 4 ppm. We are at 0.43. And then for nitrate, it wants us to stay under 10 parts per million, and we are at 3.9. So with all these regulated contaminants as well, we are still not in violation, and our water is safe according to rules by the EPA. Um, violation summary, this is something that also gets reported um, within the annual quality report, but luckily we had no violations to report. Um, everything is safe, everything is good, so we had nothing to put here. And this is just my one little thing. Um, I presented a couple months ago about our lead and copper survey, asking residents to complete this survey. Um, I won't go into too much depth, but you can go and visit this QR code or this link. It'll tell you guys more about that survey. But if you haven't completed it yet, we would like you to complete it. Questions? I don't see any questions, but I do have a follow-up. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I know in the past we've talked about, since we have two water providers in the town of Florence, we have the town of Florence that provides as well as EPCOR. Are they going to be coming and giving a presentation as well? I have requested a presentation for them, but I haven't heard back, but I will be following up because I do think it's important to receive a presentation from them as well, since a lot of our residents are serviced by them. But I can follow up and try and get that to happen. Okay, if you need any support from us, please okay. let us know and we can send a follow-up as well. All right, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. It was really informative, very complex, and I want everybody to know not only does Paige do an outstanding job for the town of Florence in regards to water quality and service, but she also volunteers her time and she puts on events to help teach the next generation with our fourth grade um, water festival right here in Florence, so thank you. Thank you. Our next presentation this evening is item C, and this is by Mr. Chris Salas, and Chris Salas is going to educate us on the precautionary boil water advisories at this time. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council. Um, due to some ongoing conversations, correspondence with ADEQ, um, there's been some there's been some changes in um, the requirements for us to issue boil water advisories, and some of those happened under um, unique circumstances. So as part of this tonight is kind of public education for council, for the residents, um, especially for the ones that are in our service area. I cannot speak for exactly uh, 
as to how EPCOR handles theirs. I've had conversations with um, them on, on their procedures, and their procedures are slightly different because essentially what the Anthem residents live in is a new modern subdivision with modern valving. So while it applies to them, their circumstances are different. And maybe towards the end, I can kind of follow up on that. So um, tonight, we're going to be discussing some of the key points is what is a boil water advisory, the legal authority to require us to do that, circumstances that could initiate a boil water advisory, customer notification, and then lifting a boil water advisory. So what is a boil water advisory? So it's a public announcement made by water system advisor advising users to boil their tap water before consumption. Um, and we'll get into the specifics in a second as to what those, what, what might be in the water or what could possibly be perceived to be in the water. Um, water should be brought to a rolling boil for at least one to three minutes, and these are used to protect the public health from waterborne pathogens and disease. The legal authority is the Safe Water Drinking Act, Section 1431. Um, that grants the U.S. Environment Protection Agency um, the, the authority to require this, and then CFR 141.202. And what we're dealing with are tier one public notifications. Circumstances that could initiate a boil water advisory. Um, an MCL violation for total coliform, nitrate, nitrite, or turbidity. A maximum residual disinfection level, violation for chlorine dioxide, violation of the surface water treatment rule, occurrence of a waterborne disease outbreak or other waterborne emergency. Interruption of the key water treatment process, natural disaster, chemical spill, or unexpected loading of the possible pathogens. And that's in a different color that to bring attention to what we're here to kind of discuss tonight. So what happens when a distribution system drops below 20 PSI? So as what's been discussed in the past, um, a majority of the downtown lacks several things. One is the proper amount of valves per linear foot of pipe, but it's not even as simple as that. There are connections made over the years that have not been captured in either as builds, GIS drawings, record drawings. There's no, there's no system drawing that enables us to be able to understand if we close these four valves, we'll be able to close off this area. So I'll focus on some subdivisions that we clearly can isolate. So the subdivision south of Florence Heights, Sunrise Estates Phase 1, Phase 2, Via Adelaida, um, obviously Western Crossings, um, Centennial Park subdivision, um, Bisbee Ranch, and what you're going to notice with all the ones I've named are two things, relatively new. I say relative in comparison to the time that Florence has been around, but they also are all subdivisions that would have been built with modern MAG infrastructure as well as C900 pipe. So we rarely ever get a waterline break on the C900 pipe. So that would only essentially impact us if we were hit by a, a contractor or maybe even by ourselves doing some uh, service line installation. So the areas that we can isolate are the areas that we really don't rarely need to. But if you were to pick a spot in the downtown, um, it's very possible on the north street that would run east and west in this area, it could have two water lines, an eight inch and a four inch. On the western boundary, it could have two or three water lines. And then on the south and east, one water line. So with that, there's an infinite, not infinite, a near infinite amount of ways that those pipes could all be connected. So does the eight that's running east and west connect to both of the north-south lines, one of them, and which one of them? Do each one of those have valves? And the, first off, the answer to that is no. They all do not have valves. So while there's been times where we believe we could isolate 
we have not been able to isolate certain areas. And some of that could be as simple as there's also been improvements over the years that were not captured in record drawings or, again, our GIS system. So there is even the unknown that we're having to deal with. So with that being said, when we have to do a system-wide shutdown after, let's say, two or three or even four hours of trying to isolate the system, we are bringing our system to a pressure in certain areas. So the earth naturally falls from our southern area to our northern area. So obviously the first people who are going to be calling on a water line break or a shutdown are the people, let's say, on Campbell Road, as far south as kind of naturally exist. And then the people way north, maybe that live up on First Street, they'll be the last people to kind of lose that pressure, if you will. So during that distance is a varying amount of pressure as the system bleeds down. But there will be parts of the town that will be less than 20 PSI. That pressure pushing outward on the pipe is what is keeping contaminants infiltrating. The infiltration of our system is a possibility. Maybe not a probability, but a possibility. And the EPA and under our Arizona Administrative Code captures that same language in um, 141.202 says that if you lower your system pressure, you need to, to do a boil water advisory. It is not to fear monger. It is merely to warn people, especially maybe people who might be either with uh, a newborn, immunosuppressed. There could be um, circumstances. So again, as, e as, as defined here, EPA defines pressure loss as a distribution system with pressure less than 20 PSI. So the loss of system pressure introduces the potential for the introduction of contaminants through back siphonage, pipe joints, and holes in the pipe. Um, the town of Florence, when we, when we back calculate every year our water losses in our system, believe it or not, our water losses are extremely low in comparison to the amount that is pumped versus the amount that is metered, incredibly low. So we don't feel like we have a whole system of potential but this is a requirement. Um, why boiling water? Cheap and effective way to make water safe to drink. Um, many organisms cannot survive at the at water's boiling point of 220 de 212 degrees Fahrenheit, and waterborne pathogens begin to die between 140 and 165 degrees Fahrenheit. So when these emergencies happen, our current process is to take a step back, figure out what we're needing to do, and give public notification so that we're giving businesses, residents, and everyone some time to prepare. And do it at a time where it is least invasive to the public. So one of the, I won't name the individual, but one of the complaints early on in my eight years was, can't we get some notice, Chris, so that if we had the, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a restaurant, to get some additional water before we're shut down because then I have to basically shut down the restaurant. And so, you know, that doesn't just apply in commercial businesses, but even residences, um, daycares, you know, schools. And, and that's obviously one of the things when we have um, Mr. Lamas will call me and say, how long do you expect? And unfortunately, my answer is usually pretty similar. Like, we have no understanding at this point how long that this will be. Like, I at least have to expose the pipe to even get an understanding of what the repair will look like. So um, some coordination that has to occur during that time. But for the areas that are impacted, public must be provided um, notice as soon as practical, but within 24 hours. Um, a, a copy of the notice and certification that requirements have been met should be submitted to ADQ. Um, and again, this requirement is applicable when there is a scheduled event, which for us will be almost pretty regular at this point because we are trying to schedule this again at an off-peak time where it will be the least invasive to, to all involved. 
Um, lifting a boil water notice can be lifted once laboratory testing shows that water is free of harmful bacteria. One of the questions that we get is, well, can't you test for a residual of chlorine immediately afterwards? And the answer is yes, and we do. And that's why we believed that we were meeting all the requirements, but there is still, I will use this word for a third time tonight, the possibility of a coliform hit to occur even with a chlorine residual, the possibility. So even with that test that we do, so without getting into a long conversation about construction practices, when we repair a line, that line is disinfected. It is swabbed, it is disinfected before going into practice. Um, so public notification must be given when a boil water advisory is lifted. So in theory, approximately 24 to 36 hours after that break has, has been completed, the testing has been done, the town will be posting that same type of notification to let everyone know that all tests have been passed. With that, are there any, and, and so I apologize, I probably should have introduced the gentleman behind me, Andrew Hyatt with ADQ is here as well um, to answer any questions or maybe fill in any blanks of things that he thinks he sees are, are important and relevant that, that maybe I missed. Um, like I said, I'm trying to communicate a policy, not have a, a debate on, on chemistry and, and biology and how the, the probabilities of it entering into our system. Tonight was just to be about to explain these are the requirements that we have coordinated with, um, with ADEQ. Are there any questions that the council may have as it relates to this? Council member? So should this happen, what is the way that you would notify people? I know you have 24 hours, but how would you go about notifying the area of concern? Well, number one, it depends on the size of that. If it's small and isolated, the town will as generally be going door to door if it's something small enough where let's just say it's um, a couple of streets within Via Adelaide. We would go door to door, but we would still meet all the other requirements of that. We're working on finalizing an SOP with ADQ's kind of blessing to make sure that because um, not surprisingly, there's no specific on if it's 62 homes or it's 46 or where some of these thresholds are. So we're trying to work on um, that. But there are requirements um, that we'll be working with the clerk's office, our, our PIO, and our town manager on. Because there's, there is the minimum requirements, and then there is the requirements that are deemed fit by our town attorney, our town manager, our council that says that's not good enough, we're going to raise the bar and also include it on this. So I'm sure that social media will be part of it. It doesn't necessarily you know, say that in, in the federal guidelines, but it is, again, making people aware. So we're gonna try to do our best to isolate the area. Um, not part of the presentation was, again, um, we have purchased equipment seven and a half years ago to do perform valve insertions. Um, we have bought some, some equipment recently to make it fit the new tooling that's out and we have just processed a, a PO to get some, some back stock of valves in. So our goal um, is to perform two insertions, two installations of valve every month for a total of at least 24. Um, we are going to be, with the new equipment that was just authorized by council at the previous meeting, we are going to be exercising valves so that hopefully they aren't breaking. Whether, if they break in the open position, that's bad. If they break in the closed position, that's bad. If they break halfway through it, that's bad. Breaking a valve is, is bad. And so we've got to get over that fear, but the equipment and the torque limiting really allows us to work with confidence and, and the record keeping of that. So there's a lot occurring that I didn't necessarily want to drag into this presentation, but we are doing everything we can to again mitigate these system-wide shutdowns. 
they haven't been something that we've taken lightly during my eight years. It's just sometimes, I, I go back to again, our time at, at Irish Cowboy. Um, we were not able to isolate some of those no matter how hard we tried. And even with sitting, shutting down the system-wide pressure, it was, it, was a, it was a chore to fix that particular one. And then as we were fixing that, we had the, um, the bottom of a valve blowout. So a water line um, repair is a very dynamic situation. Um, but the, the message is not lost on us by um, administration or town manager that this is something that we have to do everything within our powers to minimize. We, we definitely understand that and we're working towards that. There is a, um, there is policy and then there's application. And as I described in my presentation, sometimes there could be 10 water lines on the four sides combined and trying to understand why we're having cross feed with all the valves that we're aware of. Even in our GS system, there's some times where we believe we have a, a, a closed system and we're still not able to isolate. At that point, we really don't have a choice but to, you know, to shut that system down. But it is something we're gonna work hard and fast on, on, on not doing. Yes, sir, go ahead. Good evening. Uh, first, I, I just want to acknowledge that this is really good that your utility is talking about this right now. There are a lot of systems across the country and, and in, the, in Arizona in particular that wait until it happens before they have that discussion. Um, I, I don't know if you heard last week, uh, Washington, D.C. issued a precautionary boil water alert that affected a million people. And that's never something, I, I mean, Washington, D.C., I don't think anybody really wants to be in Washington, D.C. at the moment. You know, there's a lot of stuff happening there. But, but you don't want to be in that position unprepared. And one of the biggest criticisms of that precautionary alert was the timing of it. It took a while for that to get out. People felt that their health was at risk until they knew that they needed to boil the water. So it, just to acknowledge the efforts of your utility and having this discussion now to prepare the messaging now to talk about how will that message get out to our residents so that it can get out there quickly so that people can protect themselves if something were to go wrong. Water systems do their best, and I can say this honestly, hand on heart across the state, to make sure that the water is safe to drink. And I also want to acknowledge Paige, the excellent work she's done to talk about that. Um, but sometimes things happen. And so when that does happen, when your water is compromised, when there's a probability, like Chris said, or a possibility of risk, then you know the safest approach is to let people know and to give them the tools to, to be able to protect themselves. Boiling the water will 100% of the time protect you from getting ill from uh, pathogens, from, from bacteria or viruses. So I just want to acknowledge the, the effort they're doing and how this is actually really good. Uh, I think they're doing a good job to be prepared to make sure your residents are protected. Unfortunately, it will happen at times, and any time you tell your, your public that there might be something wrong with the water, that's going to create a bit of, but at least you're giving them the tools to protect themselves, and, and I think that's a great thing. So thank you for uh, allowing Chris to talk to you, and thank you for giving me a few moments. Were there any additional questions? Kathy Adam, Councilmember Adam. Uh, Mr. Stiles, I just want to thank you. I, I thought that was absolutely terrific. As a resident in downtown Florence and as a business owner on Main Street, that really helps to understand, and I feel much more confident about what you all are doing to protect us. I Just one recommendation. Should we have to do this and should we post it on the website? I would love if you put the video snippet of you explaining this. So if a resident really wanted to take the initiative and understand how serious or not it is, that they could hear that same discussion. I would take a second to acknowledge again, um, some months ago, probably in the last 120 days, I challenged Paige to go through and create an FAQ page because every water department, wastewater department, has an FAQ page. And it was something that was missing because we didn't have that staff member to dedicate that time to it. And she's created that. Now, if you go on to Chandler's and to Mesa's, they all look very similar, not surprisingly, because water's water. Um, so we'll add this to our FAQ as well. Um, I love the idea, and eventually one day, 
hopefully we're going to do a sit down interview with Paige probably for an hour long like they did in Chandler and ask all these kind of tough questions in a, a Q&A format as well. But yes, we're looking forward to, again, the, the changes and the advancements in the department. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you for being here this evening. Next, we have a presentation with an acceptance of a monetary donation from Florence Copper to the town of Florence in the amount of $50,000. At this time, I'm going to call forward Mr. Paul King. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council. I'm absolutely thrilled tonight to bring this item uh, forward to you uh, to request your um, acceptance of a $50,000 donation from Florence Copper. This money will be uh, added to our currently funded CIP project for playgrounds in Heritage Park, the two to five and the five to 12 year old playgrounds that are aged and um, need, some, um, need to be replaced. Um, the uh, funding total with the Florence Copper donation will total a budget of $300,000. And um, that will bring us um, phenomenal playgrounds. The focus of this play these playgrounds will uh, be uh, accessibility and inclusion related. We, um, uh, not only for the uh, entry level area where we're gonna put a pour in place rubberized material, but we're going to um, add uh, ladder, uh, sorry, ramp, ramping for the elevated areas of the playgrounds as well. So every piece of equipment will have uh, accessibility uh, to not only uh, for, for any um, ability and age. So it'll be really a neat thing to see. Um, so we're here tonight to request that from you. Um, Florence Copper is ex uh, extremely passionate about this project and um, we've had several conversations and um, uh, they are donating, wanting to donate this money specifically for that uh, accessibility uh, focus uh, during our design process. And we'll include them in our design process as well. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite the members of Florence Copper to come up and, and um, say a few words of their own about this, their passion in this project. And then if this is accepted, uh, we'd love to have a photo opportunity with the members of Florence Copper Council and uh, a couple of our key staff members. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, and Florence community members. For those who don't know me, my name is Sophie Dassart, and I am a proud resident of Florence, Arizona. I also serve as the Manager of Communications and Public Affairs at Florence Copper. I am honored to be here tonight to present a donation of $50,000 to the Town of Florence for the enhancement of the playgrounds at Heritage Park. Several members of our team at Florence Copper are also with me, including John Mays, our General Manager, and Michael Smotherman, our Senior Environmental Coordinator. Florence Copper's commitment to responsible mineral development is founded upon the principle of supporting the communities in closest proximity to our project, which of course includes Florence. We cherish our partnership with the town of Florence, and this project we are discussing tonight is especially meaningful to all of us at Florence Copper. Our donation, as was mentioned, will support adding features to Heritage Park playgrounds that promote inclusivity and accessibility for children with disabilities and special needs. As a project deeply invested in the well-being of our community, we believe that providing spaces where children can play and thrive is essential. I want to extend my gratitude to the Town of Florence team for making us aware of this opportunity to support our local community and for their hard work in making this project a reality. Together, we are making a tangible difference in the lives of our residents. Florence Copper is proud to support this initiative with this $50,000 donation and looks forward to seeing the positive impact it will have on the Florence community. Thank you again for allowing us to be part of this important project. 
We look forward to continuing to partner with you to enhance the lives of our local citizens in Florence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council, if there's any questions or comments, um, we'd love to accept those from you. Any questions or comments? Council Member Bucciolato. I just wanted to say thank you. It's, it's been needed for a long time, um, and it would be nice to see every kid being able to play over there safely. So thank you so much for your guys' contribution. Do you have any visuals that we can also show the community at this time, or will that be at a future time? Thank you for bringing that up, Mayor. Um, in a future meeting, we'll bring the design uh, and conceptual designs to you guys and uh, uh, get your, your feedback on those. I know that you guys have already been having discussions, so I just didn't, I wanted to bring that part up. Second, I just have a procedural question because it does say, I flipped my paper, my apologies, and acceptance. So Cliff, at this time, I know that this is presentation, but would you need a motion to be made for acceptance? I think as long as you can establish consensus to accept. I believe that we have that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And then at this time, I'd like to invite Florence Copper over and counsel down. I think that it would be nice to get a group um, picture together. Thank, Thank you. you, Mayor, Council. And Paul as well. And our interim town manager. All right, at this time, item E is our presentation of a video recap of the Town of Florence Freedom Fest that was held on July 4th, 2024. Again, Mr. Paul King. No, Erasmo, Bebo. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members, I came here this evening uh, to share an event recap and celebration of Freedom Fest held on July 4th back at Heritage Park. Um, as I mentioned, we moved Freedom Fest back to Heritage Park for, for better spacing, the, be 
the ab ability to have more activities and better shade options. An estimated 4,000 attendees were at this event. I would like to thank our sponsors, LGI Homes, SRP, and Florence Copper. These sponsorships help add quality to our event year after year. Would also like to thank our Parks and Public Works Department who prepared the park and parking plans and traffic plans. Police and fire who helped keep the event safe and fun for all. Our amazing recreation staff helped set up, coordinate, and clean up after the event. Some staff, including myself, started at 7 a.m. to about 11.30 p.m. It was a long and hot day. <laughs> our day started at the Aquatic Center from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. with games, open swim, and our annual cannonball contest. A total of 500 attendees were at the Aquatic Center that day. At the park, we had 11 food vendors and seven non-food vendors. Vendors had consistent lines, but not too long. Activities included old-fashioned relay games, a cornhole tournament, volleyball, basketball competitions, water wars, eight water inflatables, and to my knowledge, that's the most we've had at our park, a small sensory area, a balloon artist, digital photo booth, bingo in the community center, a teen zone in the community center, a cool zone, which we would try to help people stay cool for a minute or two, a foam zone, live entertainment, and of course, ending the day with fireworks. Our stage entertainment included DJ MC Joel Gibbs, the Highway Outlaws, a military branch flag presentation by the American Legion Post Number 9, Rhythm Edition, and our own rec leader, John Isaac Garcia, who played America the Be Beautiful on his guitar, who's sitting right there. And Lisha Lynn Fos, Miss Arizona Woman of Achievement 2024, who sang the national anthem prior to the fireworks. Also, I'd like to give a big thank you and shout out to 520 Events for the stage and sound on their assist and their assistance prior to the event. We have a short celebratory video to share with you now. This video will be posted on social media and the town website for the entire community to enjoy. Also, our team is already evaluating and planning for next year's amazing event. Council support for this and all our events is greatly appreciated by the event planning team. Mayor, members of council, just one more comment. Uh, uh, we did have a um, one more event at the beginning of the, the uh, 4th of July. Uh, we dedicated our new skate park equipment with the help of the mayor and um, some skateboard enthusiasts who were there and, and um, uh, council member Adam. Uh, so thank you very much for your support on that. Um, it, was, it was a great day, and, and the skateboarders in the community are very appreciative.
any questions or comments? Vice Mayor. Um, my daughter-in-law, not my daughter-in-law, my daughter, <laughs> well, my granddaughter is deaf and my daughter um, taught her sign language and we met a resident in town that was really happy to know that she's never went to the stage because she never thought she'd be able to enjoy what's going on. And when she noticed that we did have a sign interpreter on stage um, that just lit up her world, she felt included in our festivities. So, you know, thank you guys for including that sign interpreter. And we, we, uh, we're learning as we go to, you know, involving in our events. So that's something whenever we'll have a, a live entertainment or stage, that's gonna be the norm for that. I just wanted to say that I've been attending these events since I was really little. And you guys always do an amazing job. And Florence is known for the events that you guys put on. So I just wanted to say thank you. And even with your little sensory center, even at Easter when you guys had the sensory zone, mm -hmm. you guys are being very inclusive and in showing that you know Florence is a very inclusive community. And I, I'm really happy that you guys are doing that. And as he said, you know, thank you. It's definitely those little things that, that mean something big to, to some people. So thank you guys. So that, that was awesome. I, I wish I could have made it, but I think that's an awesome video to play next month at the Arizona League of Cities and Towns. Maybe have a little screen at our booth and having that on a loop just so some of the other folks can see, you know, how we're, how we're doing stuff here in Florence. So that's awesome. Good job. I could try to send you all our events that we have, you know, for, for that too. We have other videos, our post recap event. Uh, if you have, you could get with Jeff. Okay, thanks. I want to congratulate every single one of you. The amount of attention and detail you put into that was not even a hundredth of the activities you all had that day. And I love seeing the, especially the young boys and playing the basketball games because it was organized, right? It wasn't just kids wandering around. And then I did go into the cooling center and I couldn't believe how many, again, activities you had for, there, there was really something for everybody and you made us all so proud. And if you could just work on the weather a little bit, that would be <laughs> helpful. It was wonderful, thank you. Thank you. As always, well done. Right. And we'll look forward to the next event. All right. Thank you. Which is in October. Yep. <laughs> All right, next on our list is our presentation of the 2023 Florence Fire and Medical Department's annual report, Mr. Mitch Snyder. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the council. It's my privilege as your fire chief to uh, present to you tonight the fire department's calendar year of 2023 annual report. Fire department operations are driven by local ordinances, state law, federal law, and national standards. There is a lot of work that goes into the fire department long before an emergency response uh, can be handled. This report is to help identify for you all of those aspects that go into what it takes to make a fire department operational. As you look through the pages of this annual report, you'll see a number of different uh, photos of programs that are taking place in the fire department and the members of the fire department that um, bring these operations to life. As you know, through the budgeting process, the fire department works with town management to bring programs and projects forward to you for approval. 
And this is the night that the fire department wants to say thank you to all of you for supporting the fire department's needs and making the operations of the fire department more efficient so the fire department members can serve the community. Within this report, there are a number of different programs that range from fleet to facilities to equipment and beyond. Each one of these programs is taken care of by an employee of yours that works within the fire department. Not only does uh, it take a lot of work to make all of these things come together, but it takes a team of people just to be able to put this report together for you to present this. In the fire department, we started a leadership team uh, back in uh, late 2023, and the leadership team is part of your command staff and firefighters that were selected by the three different shifts that we have in the fire department. And the leadership team is here tonight to be recognized. They brought forward the equipment that you have approved for purchase. So the new equipment that you saw as you came into the building tonight, the new tender, the new command rig, and the emergency purchase fire engine. Uh, there's a great deal of work that goes into bringing that equipment together, getting it um, equipped with all of the different firefighting gear, and putting it in service. The equipment that you saw out front, two of those units are in service, and the emergency unit is shortly to be put in service. There are a few more aspects of that that need to be completed. In this report, you will meet the staff of the fire department. You will uh, identify a number of different programs that exist, some response data, some budgetary data, and it should be noted that not only does every member of the fire department work on this, but Every aspect of this fire department touches some other department in the town. We work very closely with the finance department, fleet, facilities, community services, community development, HR, legal. Everybody has an element and a piece to bring the operations together. So I'm here to answer any questions that you may have about the report. Um, we'd love to hear any comments that you have about the report. Um, and then at the end, I am hoping to introduce you to our leadership team and take a photo with, uh, with you and our leadership team if possible. Thank you. So if you have any questions or uh, comments, we're happy to hear those. If not, I'll introduce uh, our leadership team to you. Council Member Adam, like to thank you. I think I, I had um, printed mine out at home, not knowing that I was going to get this, and uh, it's very comprehensive. And I think it's really helpful for any of us uh, when we're talking about our town. I think I can sound fairly intelligent just having this. And I also want to compliment you for having pictures of all your key folks in here and showing them the respect instead of just a, a bunch of names listed. I think it speaks to the pride that you all have in your department. And thank you for doing this. It's very good. Thank you. I'd like to echo what my council member to my right said and also um, with the climate that we live in nowadays and all these fires that are happening, it assures us that you guys are ready and equipped to, to deal with, with whatever comes our way. God forbid something, something like that were to happen. So whatever support you guys need, we'll do our best to support you. And also, I didn't see a calendar in here either. Was this supposed to be a calendar in here? <laughs> That's just joking, just, just a joke. Just joking. <laughs> Apparently that'll be next. <laughs> oh, Councilmember Maldonado. <laughs> Anybody on the left? Well, <laughs> Councilmember Neal. I, I think this is great. I've always, I, I chose a career in, in, in law enforcement in a the, the, one of the biggest things that I always get is to brag on our 
PD and our fire department. Uh, honestly, man, y'all set a standard that's crazy, crazy high. No, no matter where I go, no matter what it is, I always get people to talk about our PD and our fire department. And I've always been a big, and I, it's no secret, if Florence Fire or Florence PD needs it, I'm voting yes. I don't care what it is. They need a, a tank, a plane, yes. <laughs> Saving lives is more important than anything. Yes, a tank. If they need it, they get it. Hush, you'll get your turn. If they need Air Force One. We'll try to purchase it. Uh, no, honestly, I, I can't say enough about, I can't say enough about y'all guys. It, it's great, man. I want to become a firefighter myself, but I'm too old and fat, and I don't want to do it. So thank y'all, honestly. Honestly, I thank y'all. Councilmember Bucciolato. I just wanted to say thank you personally. Thank you guys for all you do. Um, we all hope we don't ever need your services, but I'm glad knowing that we have you, you know, should we ever. So I just wanted to say thank you guys for everything that you do. Vice Mayor. I'll just echo what everyone else is saying. Um, you guys do a fantastic job. You know, you guys are there when we need you. And uh, I notice a lot of people are, are glad that you guys are around collecting some of these snakes. Uh, so, uh, you know, thank you for that too. So thank you guys for all that you do. That's going to be the August calendar. <laughs> On a serious note, oh, I, I see we have a taker back there. I saw somebody pretending like they were going to wrap a snake up around them. <laughs> well, honestly, thank you. We appreciate all that you do. Very comprehensive report, so thank you. At this time, we will go down, and we'd love to meet your whole team if you um, would like to invite them up first yes. as an introduction. Yes, thank you. I I appreciate uh, all the compliments and I accept them on behalf of our leadership team and the employees of Florence Fire and Medical Department. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our leadership team, Battalion Chief John Kemp. If you can come up and stand over to the left here. Battalion Chief Jim Walter. Firefighter Brad Taylor. Firefighter Jared Farley and Firefighter Scott Weatherby and Captain Corey Pine was unable to make it tonight. These are the members of your fire department leadership team. Thank you.
Item 7 is our consent agenda, and all items on the consent agenda will be handled by a single vote as part of the consent agenda unless a council member or a member of the public objects at the time the agenda item is called. Item A, adoption of resolution number 1909-24. This is a resolution of the town of Florence, Pinal County, Arizona, certification of resolution or authorization for treasury management services and declaring an emergency. Item B, adoption of resolution number 1910-24, which is a resolution of the town of Florence, Pinal County, Arizona, approving and authorizing Mayor Tara Walter, Interim Town Manager Bruce Walls, Deputy Town Manager Lisa Garcia, Interim Finance Director Carl Dudding, and Interim Deputy Finance Director Rebecca Jimenez to act as signatories for the transaction of business on the town of Florence banking accounts and declaring an emergency. Item C, adoption of resolution 1911-24. This is a resolution of the town of Florence, Arizona governing board designating the chief fiscal officer for officially submitting the fiscal year 2025 expenditure limitation report to the Arizona Auditor General. Item D, authorization to enter into a three-year Agreement with Centricity for a set management software using the City of Flagstaff contract, TER 2023 AG1. And this is not to exceed $112,000, 625. Item E is to approve the purchase of a UTV side-by-side -side quick response task vehicle and trailer in an amount not to exceed $85,000. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our consent agenda this evening. If anybody would like any item removed, please make a motion at this time. Seeing none, we need a motion to approve. I'll make a motion that we approve the consent agenda as read. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Our item carries. Item 8 is new business. First up is item D, which is discussion, approval, disapproval of supporting the Gila Bridge being named Rusty Greer Memorial Bridge. Ms. Garcia is participating online, so at this time we're going to go ahead and let her come in. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council, as you're aware, we follow what the county does. And tonight we do have Supervisor Goodman with us and uh, we talked to the mayor and we were following the renaming of the bridge and the story. I do not want to steal Supervisor Goodman's thunder, but mayor did put this item on the board and we do have a letter of support that's in your packet and we need to get over to the state right away if the council does so approve this motion tonight. Mayor, if you could call Supervisor Goodman up for us. Supervisor Goodman, would you like to come up to the podium? Thank you, uh, Mayor Walters and other fellow council members. I told my wife I'd keep this short. She's getting hungry, so it's really me, I'll be honest with you. Um, as, you as stated and as you have in your packet is the Pinal County Board of Supervisors approved or is in favor of, of doing this in, in support. We actually appeared before the state naming board on July 23rd. And so I'm asking that you do this um, mainly as a personal favor. Um, I was a part of the group of boys that was on this scouting activity. There was 14 of us. We started at Ellsworth Road 
and we worked our way through. This was the last part of our 50 mile bike ride to be able to get our biking merit badge. And just as we, and we stop at every water hole that we possibly could. There was no skinny dip and I'll promise you that. But as we crossed the bridge, the Gila River Bridge, um, a tragic accident occurred where a good friend of mine was struck by a car and one of our fellow scouters jumped in the back of a station wagon and you know emergency services were it's pretty limited. It was in 1972, April 1st, when it occurred. And as my dear cousin Rick jumped in the back and they put Rusty in his lap and they brought him to the old hospital here. We quickly loaded up in the truck and uh, got our bikes in there and we came down to the hospital. And back in that day, the emergency room where it was located and the freezer where they take the bodies was outside. And we were right there at the emergency room, the boys, us boys. We had no other leader, they were all in the hospital. And as they brought the gurney out, the blood stain It would mean a lot to the Greer family and to the many young men that was there that day. The Greer family has been members of this community for a lot of years. They've been in Pinal County for a lot of years. You know Dr. Wetton and his wife Christy is the youngest sister, younger sister of Rusty. Whenever her, when the youngest brother called me and asked me if this was something that could be done, we immediately started the process. This is one of the steps right here, is getting the stakeholders and their approval. You know, there's so many things that, uh, that came as a result of that. With the scouting program, there was some things that were instituted so that there was more than one leader that was involved in these type of scouting activities. And there was many other things and changes that were made to assure the safety of young men Back then, we didn't have the bike helmets. We didn't have knee pads. We didn't have any of that. And so now, there's a lot of things that have taken and transpired because of not just that accident, but others like it. So I'm standing before, here, before you today asking you for your um, vote to, uh, rec I'm, I'm asking you to, uh, to support the effort. Thank you. I do value, now on, a, on another note from the county, I do value the relationships that we have with all the municipalities in our county. It's been a great experience. I, as I'm sitting here listening to your water issues and things like that, I'm reminded of the issues that we've had with Johnson Utilities. And to know that you are taking every effort that you guys can to help address these things. Uh, and staying ahead of the game in your planning process. I've had, we've had tabletop exercises with your, your fire department in emergency situations. And they, to your point, they've been spot on. Same way with your, your uh, police department in those exercises. And so I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you and your efforts. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Goodman. When this came forward, I was very moved with what you were bringing forward and the story behind it. Council Member Maldonado, I'm gonna add a little bit more in a little bit. So the, the scouting program is a really big thing and this kind of brought light to, to something that I've been wanting to do since I was out here with the American Legion. They very active with the scouting program so I'm going to try to make an effort to try to, whenever, if this is past the night, um, to have some of our scouts and our head scouts come out. It would be a good thing from our programs oh, to, to come out and, and, and for the dedication. So, Thank you.
one thing that Florence is kind of getting known for is um, dedicating our buildings and our streets to people, and I don't think there would be any other person that that should be dedicated to. Thank you. Other than your friend, and I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. <laughs> Thank you. And I was unaware that that was our local dentist's wife's brother. So I learned something new this evening as well. With that, first I'm going to ask, can I have a motion, please? I make a motion that we approve supporting of the Gila Bridge being named Rusty Greer Memorial Second. Bridge. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. You're Appreciate welcome. it. We will get you that letter this evening. It will be signed and we will send it over. And if there's anything else you need along the way, please don't hesitate to reach out because we are supportive in this measure. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And it was worth the trip. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you. Mayor. Yes, I, sir. I have a question. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I don't I don't know if you remember or not. I was just wondering that young man ever receive his bike? Yeah, his, his merit badge? His merit badge. I believe, you know what, we were talking about it, the group of us young men that were, uh, that are still alive, and and I believe he did. But you know what, I'll ask his mom. Uh, I'll his, ask Gloria. I would love to see that yeah. incorporated on the bridge with his name where he got oh. his merit badge. That would be, I think that mm -hmm. would be good. I appreciate that. I know, I know the family members are watching this event and so uh, you, you've requested that and so consider it asked, but I'll make sure that it's double asked. Thank you. Great idea. Our next item is item B, discussion, approval, disapproval of the proposed special use permit for the outdoor shed sales at 505 South Main Street. And at this time, I'll come call forward Mr. A.J. Monroe. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council members. Um, before you tonight uh, for action is a special use permit um, for the purpose of outdoor shed sales at 505 South Main Street. This matter was first brought to the department's attention as we were reviewing a business license application. Um, during that process, we're to uh, review and consider um, whether or not um, the zoning is appropriate for the property or this use is appropriate. Um, as we were reviewing the town code, um, it was determined that um, the outdoor sales in the zoning district is not a permitted or a conditional use. As we continued to look through the zoning code, um, we found section 150.179 that talks about special uses. And included in that is the uh, outdoor sales of, of product. Um, the special use uh, requires that it be considered and approved uh, by the town council, uh, and that is why we are here uh, this evening. Um, again, the property is at 505 South Main. Um, it is a restaurant, uh, Old Pueblo. Um, if, you're, if you've been out to the site, you know that the sheds are currently on site, and on page two of the report we provided, um, so what's on the screen right now is an aerial that shows the restaurant. And on this aerial, it shows, um, so the top of the page is north, uh, main is on the left side of the screen as I look at it. Um, so you see parking on the east and on the south of the property. Um, those are currently now, um, those areas are uh, occupied by the sheds. And in your packet, we provided some um, indication of how those sheds are placed on the property. Um, we've reviewed the circulation around the building. Uh, the building circulation uh, is intact. Um, uh, uh, folks visiting the restaurant uh, have ample parking and places to park, so uh, none, of the, none of those things have been uh, uh, impacted by this uh, proposal. Um, the applicant um, is here tonight with us if you have any additional questions of him. 
Um, and I will uh, end the presentation there and uh, make myself available for questions. And um, uh, Mr. Prez uh, Soros is also here um, if you have any questions of him. Thank you. And I do want to say thank you for coming this evening, sir. I'll open it up first to council. Do you have any questions regarding this agenda item? Councilmember Bucciolato. The one thing that I will say is I would wish that people would come and ask of this first. Um, and, and seeing that there's already sheds there, it just shows that they didn't have all the information that was needed at first. So it, that's, that's, you know, just if you're a business owner or you bought property in town, please check into permitting and get with the town prior. It makes the process a lot more streamlined, a lot more easy. You don't have a lot of people saying, well, I couldn't do that. They're doing, and it just simplifies this process and it's yes or no. So that's the only thing is when I first saw this in the agenda packet, when I was reviewing it, I was like, but they're already there. So that, that would be my one thing is to say. Anybody uh, else? I, I would support uh, Council Member Bucciolato on that. It, those sheds have been there a long time. And this just came up because of a business license? Yes. I guess what, what I'd say is, you know, the district is only five blocks long. And I'm not understanding why we as a town, all of us, I'm not putting this on any one person, um, aren't vigilant. Uh, and we know our town, and we don't want to be always picking up the phone and calling and, you know. But I don't think it's that difficult to take a rundown Main Street once a month, once every other week, and see these things that are constantly happening with no permits. And that's not right. Uh, if we're ever going to get out from under being the town that just lets this happen, we need to get out in front of us, all of us. And I have no issue with this. It's been there so long, I hardly even notice it anymore. Um, and I think it's if the property owner, if that's what he wishes to do with it, and you feel that it's, it's not impeding the traffic flow, but I don't want to see another business doing work on Main Street without a permit. Thank you. Councilmember uh, Maldonado. I'd also like to echo the same thing. Um, sometimes it's, they say it's better to ask for forgiveness, but when it comes to not town, always. not on town stuff. So just, just let other folks know. But on a lighter note, I, I am glad that we can shop local with stuff like this now. On a lighter note. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You are very welcome. Um, go ahead. I was just going to ask if um, this was, um, if anybody has talked to the fire department about this to see if, should there be an issue if the fire truck had enough room to get in and out of the property and if anything of that sort was measured or taken into account because that has been a problem at other businesses good question um and it was it was asked um, as we were reviewing this and why we this was this is a perfect example uh, you, you see the condition if it were used as parking spaces to the east of the building or how the south property line would have been used before the sheds were placed um, as you continue to look through this in the current example um, the, the image on the left shows the sheds along that east property line. In the distance is the south property line. And then these are the sheds that you see off of Main. So um, the sheds placement, they're replacing some of the parking uh, that would have been you know, previously you know, used for the restaurant. Um, so that circulation um, looks to be intact for any sort of emergency services that would need to be provided. Yeah, I could see that there was enough space for parking, and then also um, there was enough space for the fire trucks. And then I also used a comparative when I was reading the agenda of the flow of some of the sh parking that happens in the streets mm -hmm. and how our trucks can navigate it. So, Vice Mayor and Council Member Neal. 
both of you singled at the same signaled at the same time. Um, my only question is: is there a limit of how many um, portable buildings he can put on the property? No, not at this point. Um, if there, if uh, the the council would like to place a limit, maybe that could be a condition of your motion. How many does he currently have on the property? Twelve. Have twelve units. Okay. Uh, currently, and if I might address the issue about the permitting, um, it was an oversight. Totally not 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 to say that I, I uh, said okay, I'm going to ask for forgiveness. No, that wasn't the intent. Uh, I was out of town. Uh, we initiated the process on my mind because two streets down the road, they, they, they were already some sheds there that had been previously sold. And that was on my mind for some reason. I thought it was the zoning. I, I had no idea that the zone was different. So, um, and when I came back and, and the sheds showed up, it's like, well, but I don't have a license to sell them because I have a small, another business. I have a uh, uh, hot dog cart and I have to get a business license for it. So it's like, we can't sell them without getting the license first. So that's why I initiated the process of getting the license. I thought it was going to be a just go get pay it and, and get it done, and that wasn't the case. But that was not my, my intent to say, okay, bring him in. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have brought him in had I known that it was uh, no zone. Would have done the proper uh, licensure before I brought, brought him into the business. But uh, anyway, uh, but yeah, I have 12 uh, uh, sheds in there. And if I have to reduce the number of them, because I thought they were going to just bring like six or seven of them, but I ended up with 12. But I, that's a possibility. I can, I can reduce the number if I have to. Council Member Neal. I, uh, I understand what everybody's saying about asking for permits. Me, myself, I want to go another way. And this is one of the oldest businesses in Florence. I, I actually would like to applaud them for hustling and bringing new business to Florence, actually. I mean, don't get me wrong, I do understand that getting permits, we've had some real serious problems with it. And I don't, I don't believe this business just went out and flat out did it because they've been here forever. I've been eating there since I was knee high to a grasshopper's behind. So I just think that that's something that needs to be said also. You know, it's great. Y'all starting new business and doing new things. I think that's wonderful. No, I, I thank you for your time and appreciate your support. Thank you. You are very welcome. They reminded me of little casitas all around your, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Council Member Buccellato. And I just wanted to clarify, I don't think it's a bad thing. And I think how they are laid out is, is very professional, um, that they're on the perimeter part of it. It's just an issue that we have to get ahead of. It's nothing against you. It's just something that's been happening a lot. And, you know, part about being a business owner is making sure that everything is covered if you leave something out you know there's could be big repercussions that's all i'm saying it's nothing against you it's let's just make sure that we do everything right for your protection as well because should something happen with you being the business owner if somebody were to fall and crack their head on that and they're not allowed to be there that would fall on you Absolutely. so and the town you know so that's all that's all that was for so thank you well, after driving the site and knowing how many he has on there, I think 12 is an appropriate capacity, if you'll agree, if we would like to make a motion. I make a motion <clears throat> that we approve the proposal of a special use permit for outdoor shed sales at 505 South Main Street um, with a number of 12 units on the property. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. You're very welcome. Unanimously passed. Thank you. Item D is discussion approval disapproval of entering into professional services contract with Safe Built. This is Brown and Associates, Shums Coda Associates, Will Dan and Kim Joyce and Associates for a period of five years at this time. I'll turn it over to Mr. Bruce Walls. Mayor, we have uh, number C. Oh, I'll loop up to it after this one. Thank you.
Mayor, Vice Member, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. First, I have to go ahead and say I am really proud of this team. Remember the time we sat around the table and we started talking about the what ifs. What if one of us went out long term due to sickness? Will we be able to go and continue Council's purpose, Council's mission? Well, that's what this professional service agreement is, it's a stopgap. It allows us to go ahead and bring in personnel either equal to the experience or greater than the experience should we have someone go out on sick or leave or something to that effect to make sure that we can continue moving our projects, council members' projects, um, forward. So again, once again, the stop measure allows us to go ahead and bring in personnel should we uh, be minus personnel in a certain position. And that, uh, those agreements cover every position that we have in town. Questions? No, straightforward. It was very comprehensive in the packet as well. With Thank that, you. we need a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve entering the professional services contract with Safe Built, Brown and Associates, Shums Coda Associates, Wilden and Kim Joyce and Associates for a period of five years. Second. Second. Motion and a second. All that are in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Item C, Resolution 1912-24. This is discussion approval, disapproval of a resolution of the Town of Florence, Pinal County, Arizona, adopting the recommended modifications to the Town of Florence classification and compensation plan by authorizing a cost of living increase for permanent part-time positions for fiscal year 2024-2025 of 4% effective July 1st, 2024. And yes, ma'am. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. My name is Virgie Felix, and I'm the HR Coordinator. I'm presenting the Human Resource Agenda on behalf of Catherine, the Human Resource Director. The recommendation before you is to include three regular part-time positions that are currently on the town's pay scale. The 4% cost of living adjustment to retroactively be effective July 1st, 2024, as it was for the full-time staff. And those three part-time positions are the crime analyst, the police records clerk, and the recreation programmer at the um, senior center. Thank you, Virgie, so much. And I apologize for checking it and moving on to the next one. You're good. Are there any questions regarding this? Seeing none, we need a motion. Again, it was very comprehensive, so thank you. I make a motion that we approve the resolution of the Town of Florence adopting recommendation to modify the Town of Florence classification compensation plan by authorizing the cost of living increase for permanent part-time positions. Fiscal year 24-25, a 4% effective July 1st, 2024. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And item E is resolution number 1913-24. This is discussion approval disapproval of a resolution of the Town of Florence, Pinal County, Arizona, adopting land use assumptions, infrastructure improvements plan, and development fee update report, and amending the fee schedule of terms and fees of the Town of Florence, effective August 1st, 2024. I'm going to turn it over at this time to Mr. Carl Dudding. <laughs> Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the Council. Um, the, the motion, uh, excuse me, the resolution is going to be effective September 1st. There's an error in the RCA. Um, on May 6th, the town adopted the 2024 impact fee study, and both the contractor and town staff missed applying the construction credit to the impact fees. The town charges 4% on construction and 2% on normal TPT sales transactions. Therefore, we have to take that 2% differential and apply it into the impact fees as a credit. Um, so this will um, lower our impact fees on single family residents by $533 per unit, uh, $477 on a multifamily um, dwelling, and uh, 
$1.20 per square, square foot on commercial, uh, $1.02 on an office per square foot, and $0.48 cents per square foot on industrial. Um, these fees have not gone into effect, but they will go into effect September 1st, so no refunds will need to be issued. Excellent. Thank you. Are there questions, comments? Seeing none, we need a motion. I make a motion to approve resolution number 1913-24 is read. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have our town manager report. And Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, we received word last week that Kroger, the parent store of Fry's Foods and Safeways, um, has identified more than 100 Arizona supermarkets it plans to divest to go ahead and win approval for a proposed two point, excuse me, $24.6 billion purchase of Albertson's company. Um, what that means for us is our Safeway has been identified as one of the 101 stores that could be divested. If it is, if this is approved, um, our Safeway will be sold to CNS Wholesale Grocers. Did a quick little search online. CNS Wholesale Grocers basically has a footprint East Coast. Um, you probably will um, know the grocery markets that it has as Piggly Wigglies. If you've ever traveled kind of towards the East Coast, you'll see several of those. It's the opinion, at least of this article, that um, if this goes through, CNS will probably go ahead and kind of expand its market maybe towards West Coast. So we may potentially see the Safeway as a Piggly Wigglies or some other type of grocery store. We have already reached out to Safeway and talked to management. And should this happen, uh, we will go ahead and assist in that transition and make sure that we are part of that process so we can make sure that council stays informed. As we get more information regarding this, we will also go ahead and keep you informed. And last, uh, um, I will be making a run up to Flagstaff. I have been selected to be on the Arizona Accreditation uh, Law Enforcement Board as a commissioner. So hopefully I will be sworn in tomorrow morning. That's it for the town manager's report. Congratulations to you on that, sir. And I, I do know in doing some research on CNS as well, there were some other names I saw like Grand Union and so it's not necessarily that we will have a Piggly Wiggly in Florence, Arizona. We may have another grocery store name, but they do, as you mentioned, have a footprint on the East Coast and they're mitigating this way. All right, any questions for our town manager? Yes, sir. I just want to congratulate you, and if you need a plus one tomorrow, I got the day off. So, <laughs> and uh, also, um, also, uh, I was going to ask to see um, if there was anything that came up on Florence Hospital. I don't know if anything, any word, you have any word on that? Mayor, Vice Mayor, and thank you, Council Member Maldonado. Yes, we have sat down and we've met um, with, um, I was looking for Walter, Walter's gone. Um, I met with him in the spring, in March, before the announcement had come out. He had reached out to the municipality and he had communicated that they were going to be having some liquidations in the upcoming you know, future. But we were assured that Florence, as well as another one, would be fine in the long run. And I know that you recently had a meeting from what I just heard. Yes, ma'am, you're absolutely correct. And he um, gave us the same information. Florence Hospital is here to go ahead and stay. Uh, we may go ahead and see some liquidation of some assets and those kinds of things. But um, Florence Hospital is here, and um, they're here to stay, and we're going to support them 100%. Thank you. Can I say something? Yes. When you say Florence Hospital, I think of 
Florence Hospital, and that's a whole nother, yeah. <laughs> Understood. The Florence Hospital in the Anthem area of Florence. Because this one here is Florence, and that's Florence Anthem, yes. right? Okay. It just took. Next, we have a call to the public. This is our second call to the public this evening. So, if there's anybody that would like to speak at this time, now is your opportunity, either in person or online. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and close the second call to the public. And then we have a call to the council. Council Member Neal. I can start to the right if you'd like. What? Ain't nobody asked you nothing? Oh, she didn't lose seat. Um, I have nothing go go first I love that I almost get to be a teacher up here as well especially when I hear people requesting new seats <laughs> council member Bucciolato five more months five more months um, I just we pretty much talked about everything tonight I just wanted to say um, Thank you for all of the reports, and thank you guys for um, being very vocal with council about what is going on. Um, it's always nice to get an email and be one of the first informed when people start asking questions, so it's, it's much appreciated. And um, other than that, I was just gonna say good job to the town for the 4th of July. Beautiful fireworks as always, and thank you guys for all that you do. Councilmember Adam. I'd just like to reiterate my thanks to Florence Copper, um, who's done so much for the town, but I think especially I'm so proud because, you know, a few years back we didn't have the autism certification. We're now helping the hearing impaired or the, the sign at our events, and now to help uh, special needs kids at our park. I, I just, I'm so proud of this, so thank you, Florence Copper. Council Member Maldonado. First of all, I'd like to thank Benny. Um, I encourage veteran-owned businesses a lot. Um, thank you for what you do and thank you for your service. Um, thank you to the mayor for assisting me. Um, this past Thursday, we, the mayor and I had the privilege, the privilege of uh, going to the American Legion and, and um, doing a proclamation for Joan Baker Day. And I was very humbled by being able to do that. And I'm sorry we didn't invite everybody, but it was kind of short notice, but um, you were with us in heart, and it would have been Joan's 60th birthday. So if, for those that didn't know Joan Baker, just to, um, just, just to make it real short, um, she was a very instrumental part of our community, and she gave back even when she lost everything. And those of you guys know what I'm talking about, when she lost, her and her husband lost everything, and they still were talking about how can I, how can I do, something for you. So I know she's looking down on us right now, but thank you, Mayor, for, for doing that. It, it meant a lot from, from Bill and the family. So I appreciate that. Um, also, uh, I had the privilege of going to the chamber mixer at LGI, and uh, it was awesome. So I encourage more folks in these businesses to, to join the chamber. And as an encouragement also now, too, you don't longer have to pay the 10 bucks to, to mingle. So if you're part of the chamber, just come on out and you don't have to pay the 10 bucks anymore. So we like to have more businesses come out there and mingle and, and network, because that's where we're about networking and seeing how we can work together and, and form those relationships like Florence Copper. Thank you. Um, and finally, please get out there and vote. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor. I think everyone covered everything. Uh, uh, we do have students returning on Wednesday, so be cautious of uh, all the kids walking back and forth to schools. Uh, there are gonna be some new kids walking out there that have never done it before, so we need to be very defensive in our driving, so watch out for the little ones. All right, so I was able to cross three things off of my list, so you will not have to hear them 
again. I did want to just make sure to let everybody know, piggyback off of Council Member Maldonado to get out there and vote because we did have a lot of questions that came up because this is a primary and in the primary when you're looking at your local and your county level, the elections are pretty much determined in the primary, especially when you have two people, like we have two people mayor-wise going for a seat for example. Anybody who receives 50% plus one, they're automatically seated in that election. So it's really important to get out and vote, especially during the primary election, because locally, county, those are the levels that are closest to the people. Those are the levels that are serving the community. And I just wanted to provide the education that because Arizona is an open primary, if you are registered as an independent, um, party not disclosed or other, you can request a partisan ballot, whether you want a Republican ballot, whether you want a Democrat ballot. And you can do that by visiting Pinal Votes. They have the new website out. You can go and visit the brand new facility that's right over here in Florence, or you can go ahead and just call their number and they will walk you through it. So again, exercise your voice. I encourage everybody to vote. And in August, that was a fantastic idea for the Arizona League of Cities and Towns. We are all going to be going to our annual conference. And this is where we have an opportunity to talk about upcoming legislation that will impact our municipalities and our state in the upcoming year, come together with others to discuss things that are happening, trends, and making plans to move forward. We are bringing our teen council as well, so we'll have a booth set up, so we'll be showcasing Florence, Arizona, and having that on display, on loop, showing everybody this is what's happening, because we do a lot in our community. We have premier activities and events, and we don't charge for them. Everybody is welcome, and it's because of the fabulous sponsorships that are afforded to us and the partnerships that we've built. So I also want to reiterate thank you very much. And I'm, I'm looking because we do have Florence Copper in our audience, so they're here. And I just want to say thank you because it is partnerships like that that truly do make a positive impact and difference. So that is all I have this evening. We do not have an executive session. So with that, I need a motion to adjourn. Make a motion that we adjourn. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? We are adjourned, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much.